Welcome, Deacon Keating. Thank you. We have uh, been responding in a very real way to this present moment we find ourselves in and which many other people find themselves in, the mystery of this sacred time in the life of the church. I think it's important to remember that the church is not necessarily just about an institution. The church actually is the mystical body of Christ. It's us, isn't it? It's us, and that's why a lot of people are remembering during this time of seclusion and sequestering and quarantine is that uh, the the church is the people, and um, we kind of miss each other. Mm -hmm. But we also have to remember that the church is still existing, even though we can't see each other. It's existing in our personal prayer from home. It's existing from the acts of charity that are being done many, many times secretly. Some, of course, very dramatically on TV with our healthcare professionals. Mm -hmm. But also that the mass is continuing. Uh, Sacraments are continuing, uh, just not before big crowds. So the church is very much alive in its essence, which is human beings coming together out of faith in the uh, risen Jesus. On Good Fridays in the past, I think I've been, uh, I thought I was very stoic that, you know, I would enter into the practice of watching the Passion of the Christ. I think one of the most uh, provocative, but also so compelling uh, experiences of entering into the actual uh, death of Christ, uh, his trial and his persecution and everything else. And, uh, you know, when I make it through and I thought, okay, I did it. I walked with him during that. Um, but you know what, Deacon Keating, this year, I, I don't think I have it in me to watch it. I, mm. I just don't. I, it just, the, I just don't think I can do it this year. Mm-hmm. And what, why is that? What are you missing? Um, it's so, it was one thing to enter into his pain, but now it's like it, it's all of, all of the pain. There's been so much pain. There's been so much suffering that I mean, at least for us in America, and this is a first time dosage, a yes, in our families, we've had things happen, but this on a global scale, which encompasses our family, like a mushroom cloud, it encompasses our family and everything then and in, in to also experience his suffering. I don't, I just don't know. I don't know if mm-hmm. I emotionally or physically have it in me this year. Yeah. Well, it makes sense. You know, you're emotionally filled with kind of universal pain. But, you know, even that excess of pain, if you will, in our psyches Mm -hmm. is to be brought to him at the cross and uh, the fulfillment of God's uh, creation. You could call the cross the fulfillment of God's creation. There's an Orthodox theologian, Father John Baer, and he has a beautiful analysis of the meaning of human life. It begins when God says, Let us make a human in our image. And it ends when Jesus says on the cross, it is finished. Well, what's finished? The creation is finished. The creation of the human person that God willed from the very beginning. Now, of course, Adam messed it up. And um, the new Adam had to relentlessly uh, see to the end the good will of the Father, which was the which was to create the human being. And upon the cross, Jesus is the human being. He is the one that God had in mind since the beginning of the world. And that's why we go to the cross at Mass, because we are trying to uh, unite ourselves with the human being, the one that the Father always willed, the Christ. Now, of course, since the fall, the human being in order to reach the potential of human, um, the human end, um, was also divine. And so God's will from the beginning was to have human and divine coexisting together in complete peace. We called that the Garden of Eden. And again, that got messed up. So now the Garden of Eden is actually Jesus. He is where humanity and divinity coexist in complete union. And we want to get in on that, so to speak. And so the sacraments are the way that we get in on it. We get in on the Garden of Eden. We get in on the will of God, which was to be at perfect peace with humanity 
with humans perfectly listening to the love of the Father and obeying that love. And we do that by faith being vulnerable to the Eucharist. And this is why it's so important to have the crucifix in the church, at the very center of the church, because it's the sign of the completed will of the Father. Here is the human being that will now uh, gift the rest of humanity with the peace he experiences with his Father. There was restlessness in the garden, but now in Jesus there is peace. And he wants to give us this peace so that we can coexist in Holy Communion with the Father as well. And so whatever pain we're feeling, whatever fear we're experiencing, we go to the cross. We go to the apex of the Father's will. We go to love itself, totally revealed and open to receive us, all of our fears, all of our pain. So if you can't watch uh, The Passion of the Christ, then maybe, again, you just want to take the crucifix off the wall, and today and tomorrow, um, just sit with the crucifix and press your index finger over the open side of Christ and pour all of your fears into his sacred heart, that open wound which goes right to his sacred heart, and let that man, the ultimate human, the one that God had in mind from the beginning, the one who is completely one with divinity, let that person heal your fears and your pain. Mm -hmm. The thing about uh, the liturgy of the church, which was always, I thought, so beautiful about the tritium, and we talked about this the other day, that it's one beautiful liturgy. Liturgy, of course, means, I think it's the Greek for uh, the work of the people. And it's a time when we, we give it space. So on the Holy Thursday, the liturgy, a lot of people don't realize, it doesn't end. It didn't stop. We just took a break. It was just a break. Then we come together again on Good Friday. And there's so many compelling moments because it's a liturgy, so it's our work that is so different than other um, celebrations. Yes, it is a celebration, you know, a celebration of love that we experience. I mean, even that entrance, it's quiet. It's a quiet entrance. And just the, it, I mean, it's, you, you've celebrated many of those. I'm sure they've been uh, very special to you too. That's what's most compelling about Good Friday is it's silence. Mm. Um, the prostration of the clergy at the beginning and then silence. Um, and it's silence before the mystery of death. Mm. And silence before the mystery of death that is not void of presence or meaning, but it, it is to some extent uh, awe, because it's filled with God now. Uh, God has literally filled death. Uh, the enemy of God, evil, sin, death, has been taken down by God, by God literally entering those evils. And again, this is the great um, contemplative uh, fruit of the Triduum, is that we are silenced by this great love that God would literally go into the enemy. He said that this is um, something that he commended for us to do too, when he said to forgive our enemies, to love those who persecute you. In other words, with his spirit, we can actually withstand evil and contend with it, never by ourselves, never by our own puny will, but only when it is filled and engulfed by the divine presence. And God could go into the scariest thing about being human, which is death, and fill it with light and his presence and victory. And so when the clergy lay down on the floor on Good Friday, they are prostrating before this great mystery of God defeating evil an evil that we all have to go into, but now we go into it in the presence of the resurrection, because Jesus is in us. Jesus is living in us. The resurrection is in us. So believers go into death the way God went into death, with hope and with power. And ultimately, it's, it's 
already a foretaste, whenever we're meditating on death on Good Friday, it's already a foretaste of resurrection, because the resurrection was in the crucifixion, because the resurrection was God, and God is the one who was dying, and now God is in you through baptism. And so your death is already the resurrection, because the divine is already in you, it's already happening. And so there's great hope, even though it's a day of silence, meditation, it's also a day of hope because of what we know is coming. Mm. The, uh, once again, we end up uh, hearing in the Liturgy of the Word, the uh, not only, and how can I say not only, because the Isaiah reading, the suffering servant, is one of the most powerful readings ever. Um, in that foreshadowing of what was going to come next, we hear the gospel once again, but this time it's from the contemplative. It's from John. It's his his uh, experience, the one who was at the foot of the cross with the Blessed Mother. Uh, it it's uh, it's so uh, important for us to to enter into that particular gospel, all the gospels, but that particular gospel this time in prayer, isn't it? Well, John is the one who gives us that famous line, it is finished. Mm -hmm. It is finished. What is finished? Um, this creation, creation is finished. Uh, and everything after uh, the crucifixion, the resurrection, everything after that is uh, creation, a sort of groaning, as Paul says, to catch up to what Jesus has already done. Uh, that perfect man, that perfection of God. And again, perfection is not, as we understand it perhaps mathematically, uh, with no errors or faults. But scripturally, perfection is what Jesus said it was, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And then he contextualized that within the sense of welcoming your enemies, welcoming the other welcoming those who are not you. And of course, that's what Jesus was literally doing on the cross. He was welcoming those who were the enemy, who were, were not him. In other words, were against him. And this is what perfection is for the, for the Christian. Uh, on the cross, Jesus was the perfect man because he was the man who was forgiving, welcoming of the enemy, welcoming of the one who was literally killing him, and still not calling down uh, his angels to destroy them, but actually welcoming the one who is killing into his own heart. As the scripture says, God has the sun shine on the good and the evil. And that's what Jesus was doing from the cross. He was saying, you're still welcome in me, even as you're killing me, because I am love itself. And so as we meditate on Good Friday and on the crucifixion, we're also meditating on our own dignity as Christians. We have, have, again, through the Holy Spirit, we have that spirit of perfection in us, the spirit of forgiveness, the spirit of welcoming those who are not ourselves. In other words, to no longer live as you know extensions of our egos, but to literally be hospitable to the other, even the other who would hurt us through the process of forgiveness. Obviously, great mysteries here that the Holy Spirit must tutor us in in real life. We can always think about them and write about them and speak about them. But when it comes to living them, we really need the incredible combustible power of the Holy Spirit, moving our will to actually welcome the enemy and forgive those who are hurting us. But it's all there on the cross. The perfect man, the forgiven man, the man who is in perfect harmony with God, all of those things Jesus is trying to gift us with as well. You know, welcoming the enemy. When you said that, it's just like, oh, <laughs> we, we welcome the enemy. Um, is, that, uh, is that possible? Are we capable of that? We see it most plainly, I think, when someone dies in Christ, when you're at the bedside of a saint, Mm -hmm. And you see the greatest enemy of human life, death, being embraced peacefully in faith 
and in Christ. And we always say things at the end of this kind of dying, like, wasn't that amazing? Didn't I experience some grace or peace myself? It was very much like the centurion at the cross when he said, truly, this is the Son of God. There was something that was passed between the one who is welcoming the enemy and the people who are witnessing the one who is welcoming the enemy. And so is it possible? Yes, we see it when people die in Christ. What other enemy is greater than death? You know, we always have a configuration in our mind of the enemy. It could be someone as close as our spouse, someone who's being abused perhaps by their spouse, mm -hmm. an enemy from a foreign land. And we have these uh, images of what an enemy is. But the enemy is coming for all of us in the form of death. And that's what our whole life is preparatory for. Will we welcome it in Christ and therefore disarm it in Christ, in the power of the resurrection? Or will we you know, um, approach the enemy in fear and trembling? And uh, as a psychiatrist friend said to me, you know, uh, going out kicking and screaming. Or will we die uh, like a candle being blown out? Uh, this is how the saints approach the greatest enemy, because their whole life through the Eucharist, developmentally, progressively, they have become Christ. So that means they have been able to welcome the enemy on the cross of their deathbed, because the Spirit of Christ was in them. So yes, very possible. The history of our church is the possibility of being hospitable to the enemy, the greatest enemy of all, death. You know, I remember a uh, time when I was, I was actually a young liturgist, parish liturgist, and we had just opened a new church, and we were going to do all the liturgies just the way you're supposed to, you know, just according to the right, just the way it was meant to be. And I remember being so frantic during that tritium, trying to make sure everything was perfect. Someone said to me later, that that's kind of a folly. You strive for excellence, but never strive for perfection because you can't meet it. But I, I remember when it came time for the veneration of the cross, and we had one large wooden cross instead of a lot of little ones, which I've come to realize, is, you know, it doesn't really matter. But then I was just such a purist. And we had one big cross. And watching, the moment came where everybody came to venerate the cross, and they had long lines, one big long line going forward to the altar just to kiss that large cross. And I couldn't do anything. There was nothing left for me to do. Couldn't run around. I just had to wait. And I remember the feeling that in just watching all those people, and at first I was anxious because I wanted to get it done. You know, let's go on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. But something happened. It wasn't going to go any faster than it was going to go. And in watching all of them going up a couple steps, people with wheelchairs and, and older couples and little kids and all that, it makes me cry now. I mean, it was just the most, I found myself just breaking out in tears. And, it, you know, I never thought of myself as emotional, overly emotional, but I could, I had to go in the sacristy. I couldn't stop crying because it was just the most compelling thing I think I've, I've ever experienced. I can't say it's just the, what I've ever seen. It was an experience. And um, it, uh, in that moment of venerating the cross, I, it, it, you know, to this day, I mean, it's 20-some years later, and I still, it, it just, uh, it, it, that's the power, isn't it? When you when you're forced to just like today, we're just forced to stop like I was then. Nothing left to do. And you just have to you just have to let the moment take you. I mean, you have no other choice really. Yeah, that, that procession to the crucifix is uh, an embodiment of salvation. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the reasons maybe it's so compelling to watch and move into a contemplative mode of watching is because you're watching humanity move through to its very salvation, to kiss the cross, to kiss, to kiss what? To kiss the reconciliation of humanity and divinity, to kiss the end of death and the beginning of the resurrection. It's just 
too much for our psyches to even contain. And so when you're watching the procession, very much like Ash Wednesday, those two processions are very interesting. The Catholics line up um, to process to these symbols of death because unconsciously they know that that is the true procession, the true procession of human life. And this, again, this um, coronavirus quarantine we're in is making us all strip down bare to the essentials of life. No more hiding places from consciousness of death. It's right here before us all the time. That's why the physician is on TV every day, because he's trying to warn us against death. So this, we're thinking about it all the time. Mm -hmm. During the regular, the regular cycle of our life, we suppress it. But now it's right out there in the open. Where else is it right out there in the open? On Good Friday, on Ash Wednesday, when we literally possess, possess, uh, process to our, our grave, if you will. <laughs> we get ashes on our head. We literally process to, to Calvary, where death is present in all of its excruciating pain, the most extreme kind of death. But at the same time, as I said before, within that dying, because of who it is who is dying, is also worth a kiss. Because we know that at the end of his dying will be our living. And so we're kissing the complete mystery when we kiss the cross. We're kissing the mystery of our own death, and we, we know we're heading toward it. We're also kissing the end of meaninglessness over death. Because inside the death itself, as we attach ourselves to Christ through Holy Communion, inside that death itself is the resurrection. And so we're also kissing our salvation. And that's going to be a very difficult thing to not witness this year in Good Friday. But uh, again, maybe we can sit quietly in our homes, hold the crucifix, kiss the crucifix ourselves in our homes, and process in a way to salvation. Yeah, I mean, to venerate the cross and it's in our own home, because I just, as you were talking, I, it made me so sad to think that we may be done with that particular gesture of kissing the cross on Good Friday. Or venerating it in some way. I mean, now mm-hmm. there, you know, we're we're even if, even when this pandemic ends, will we ever be able to do that again as a community? Will they ever? Will that ever be allowed again, because of our well, fears? Well, it might be nice if that's true. If if the fear, if it's a reasonable fear, then we mm-hmm. should obey it. Um, and if it's true that we can never cr- uh, cr- kiss a a one a unified cross. It might be good then for the priest of the parish to invite every single family to bring in their own home crucifix, and at that time of the ma- at that time of the liturgy, to actually have everyone uh, reverence their own crucifix uh, that they brought to church with them. Mm. You know, that's something I I don't know if we appreciate how much that means. I mean, throughout in our homes, we um, we have crucifixes in every room. I mean, that's just, that's, if for us, it's always a, it's, he, he dwells there. It's a mark, it's a reminder in every place we are. And, uh, but even for us, I think we, sometimes we take it for granted. It's not just home decor, you know. It, and for me, I, I, I'll be the first one to say, maybe that's what it became for a while, home decor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, it's a true sacramental, and uh, especially the, the blessed crucifix. It carries a grace with it, and um, each time when we pass it in our own home, or maybe we should even touch it, just bow our head before it, or say a quiet prayer before it, it's there for that reason to give us the grace of deepening our own faith in the the Savior. There's a, a passage from a work by Carol Hauslander that has stayed with me for oh gosh, probably a good 15 years since when I first read it. And uh, ultimately, it's the culmination of what happens on Good Friday. And in one line, she just sums it all up. She goes, this is the day we killed God. Yes, and that's always such a horrific sentence, And but we should say it more often than we do. Um, and again, like anything starkly true, sometimes we mask it and cover it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, her language, uh, the day we killed God, 
Uh, and that's been repeated again and again, and, and without being too dramatic, it's repeated every time we sin. Every time we sin, we are choosing to separate ourselves from God's life. And in a, in a, a burst of mental illness, we think we can design our own life. And so that separation is like a killing or a death. And so again, that's the, the ragged history of, of humankind, is that we are, we are more stupid than we think we are, because we keep repeating the same error, not only generation and generation, but we keep repeating the same error in our own short, brief lifetime. How many times have we repented and gone to the sacrament of reconciliation? We still don't get it. We still think that choosing a life of separation from God will somehow give us life, the great satanic temptation. Only the really simple, not even the intellectual, but only the really simple-minded, in other words, the, the person with a clear mind, will be the one who says, you know what, this temptation that keeps coming back to me to separate myself from God is idiotic. And from here on in, I refuse to do it. I want to stay in the stream of life. I don't want to go away toward death anymore. And of course, this is the triumph of the saints. But yeah, we killed God. That's our great crime. That's our great shame. But our great glory, through the yes of the Blessed Mother, is that uh, that distantiation between God was reconciled in the flesh of one man, Jesus. And now we had better uh, become beguiled by that man so that we can be rectified before God as well. Hmm. For many uh, around the world this time, and particularly in this hemisphere, uh, springtime is coming. And tomorrow will probably be, hopefully for many, a, a brighter day than it's been. Maybe sun warming out. It's a day that from the, the actions of what happens on Good Friday, though, it almost demands what the scripture says. It demands rain, a thunderclap, <laughs> lightning, wrenching of veils, and all kinds of things. And yet, even in this time of the pandemic, it's almost as though, you know, we're, we want to be in that light. We want to have the sunshine. There's nothing wrong with that, but there's, isn't there, it, it's like, we almost want to have the drama of everything, and yet the sun keeps bursting in. Something keeps mm -hmm. bursting in to make it not as gloomy. Am, am I making sense about? Yeah, I don't. Uh, sometimes you know we have to. We want to dramatize Good Friday, um, and maybe even to help our emotional life connect with the death of Jesus. Mm. And so I know people who say, "Oh, I hate when Good Friday is sunny because it's contradiction to what I'm supposed to be feeling." But, you know, we live in, the, we live in uh, the constant knowledge, which is truly astounding when you think of it. Even the apostles didn't have the knowledge we have. We live in the constant knowledge of the complete triduum. So we don't have to artificially feel sad on Good Friday. And we don't have to artificially be joyful on, on Easter. We ha always have the full Christ before us. We are always, 365 days a year, meditating on what we are concentrating now in these three days. And this concentration um, is a great gift for us, especially for those who maybe forget the mystery is among us all the time. But um, it, it can help our prayer life sometimes to be more subdued on Good Friday, just like it can help our prayer life to be more joyful, music, flowers on, on Easter Sunday. And that's just our incarnate state as human beings. But um, we hold the whole mystery in us all the time. Yeah, I think it was one of my kids a long time ago said to me, but mom, why don't they just call it Bad Friday? It's a bad <laughs> day. It's a really bad day. Why don't we just call, why don't we call it Good Friday? I, I would, oh, that's a good, that's a good question. You know, you try right. to explain the importance of the, the sacrifice and the great love and what a gift mm -hmm. and everything like that. But it's hard. I mean, why don't we just call it Bad Friday. Mm -hmm. This was a bad day. Probably because what we're just talking about here is that theologically it's impossible to call it bad because we know the ending. Mm -hmm. And we also know the one who went through it. And we also know that the word good is sort of a euphemism for sacred. Mm 
It was like, this is just the holiest of days. Yeah, why don't we just call it Sacred Friday? That would be good. <laughs> Sacred Friday would be a Sacred, really great title. Yeah, that would be a great title. Mm. Well, any final thoughts on this particular day, Deacon Keating, in 2020, when the world is so crazy? Well, just remember, in, in intercessory prayer, all of those families now well into the thousands who have actually experienced death in their family during this horrible virus, that this Good Friday is going to be a particular burden. Easter is going to be a particular burden for them. So as members of the body of Christ, we want to intercede for those families who have lost a husband, a father, a, a wife, a mother uh, to this dreadful disease. And we commend them to the most sacred heart of Jesus. And we ask him to console these families and for anyone who is sick in the hospital, and particularly to grow very close to the healthcare workers and to console them, especially in their fears or in their weariness. So Good Friday has a particular meaning this year for all of those families. And we also ask the Holy Spirit to give wisdom to our secular leaders so that they stand their ground and that they remain true to what reason and science is telling us and to not to bow to political pressure or the irrationality of uh, people who don't see clearly. So we ask the wisdom uh, of the Holy Spirit to come upon our secular leaders as well. And then we do ask for some quiet time on Good Friday and to do, uh, take those crucifixes not only um, from the wall, but press them against our hearts. You know, you brought up a, a good point. Uh, the, in the liturgy, there are the 18 prayers of intercession. It's the time when we, for a lot of Catholics, it's the standing up, kneeling down, <laughs> sitting down, standing up, kneeling down. And, but it's because it's supposed to incorporate all of us, all of mm -hmm. our actions. This is this Good Friday of all Good Fridays. Thank you, Deacon Keeney, because it really is the great day of intercession, isn't it? Yes, it is. And uh, that's what Jesus was doing from the cross. He was interceding for the world. And so in him and through him, we, we do the same. Could you give us a, a, a blessing on this Good Friday? We miss those, I think, here, sure. the blessing. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we thank you for Calvary. We thank you for your yes always to the Father so that the perfect man was present to humanity upon the cross. You are that perfect man because you are God and humanity reconciled. We wish that too, Jesus. We wish to be reconciled to you. May this Good Friday be that day of reconciliation. And we ask you to watch over us and to bless all of us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Deacon Amen. Keating. Thank now, you. Now we're off to the more, probably one of the most mysterious days of them all, Holy Saturday. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.